Skeptical critics love to try and poke holes in the gospel narratives, claiming that they're full of historical blunders, but in recent times, many of these so-called holes have been filled in by the shovel of archaeology. In this video, we're going to run through the top five examples of critics looking bad in the light of new archaeological discoveries. If you're a fan of American history, you're probably familiar with the name Thomas Paine. Paine was a founding father and the philosopher for the Revolutionary War. His essay, Common Sense, resonated with the American commoners and rallied them behind the movement for independence. Paine was also a flaming deist, and he wrote a scathing critique of the Bible called The Age of Reason. Here's one of Paine's shots against the Gospels. He writes, There could be no such person as a King Herod because the Jews and their country were then under the dominion of the Roman emperors who governed then by tetrarchs or governors. So in other words, the Gospel writers got the title of Herod wrong. Well, a couple of centuries later, Paine would be proven wrong with some hard evidence in the form of coins. Many coins surfaced that had the inscription, King Agrippa. It turns out that Paine's critique here is less than reasonable after all. Frank Zindler is a lifelong atheist activist who has written extensively against the existence of the historical Jesus. He once argued that Nazareth, the town Jesus grew up in, also never even existed, calling it as mythical as the Jesus family that was supposed to have lived there. Zindler reasoned that neither the Old Testament, the Apostle Paul, the Talmud, or Josephus ever even mentioned Nazareth. Since the Talmud and Josephus together list a hundred other villages combined in Galilee, this does seem to be like a glaring oversight. So what exactly do we make of it? Well, Mr. Zindler, meet Yardena Alexandre. In 2009, her team from the Israeli Antiquities Authority unearthed a house from what they say is first century Nazareth. Here's what she had to say regarding this finding. The discovery is of utmost importance since it reveals, for the very first time, a house from the Jewish village of Nazareth and thereby sheds light on the way of life at the time of Jesus. The building that we found is small and modest and it is most likely typical of the dwellings in Nazareth in that period. Zindler, the Jesus mythicist, has been mythbusted here. Some have said that John was inventing some theological fan fiction when he described the Pool of Bethesda. Let's read about it a bit. In John 5, 2, it says, Now there in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate was a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. You know the story, Jesus heals a paralyzed man who'd been suffering there for 38 years. Well, a 20th century French liberal critic by the name of Alfred Loisy had this to say about John's account. The ancients who thought they found in the spring a symbol of Judaism, and in the five porticos an allusion to the five books of the law, no doubt encountered the thought of the evangelists. So in other words, John's just making up some theological fluff to fit his narrative. Until the last century, there was no evidence outside of John for the Pool of Bethesda, but archaeologists unearthed it back in the 1950s. And what do you know? It was just as John described it, located by the Sheep Gate and enclosed by roof colonnades and spanned across the center by a fifth colonnade. Au revoir to that theory, Monsieur Loisy. Luke 7, 1 through 10 describes Jesus healing a centurion's servant. Despite the man being a commanding officer in an occupying Roman army, the Jews pleaded that the man deserved the favor from Jesus because he did build them a synagogue. But the mention of a synagogue in early first century Capernaum has caused some skeptics to cry foul. Here is skeptical New Testament scholar Robert M. Price. He writes, a major collision between the gospel tradition and archaeology concerns the existence of synagogues and Pharisees in pre-70 CE Galilee. Historical logic implies that there would not have been any since the Pharisees fled to Galilee only after the fall of Jerusalem. Okay then, well, what does archaeology actually show us. Here is an expert, Ted Wright, who writes, Remains of the first century Jewish synagogue where Jesus spoke and performed a miracle has been excavated. This synagogue also marks the beginning of his public ministry. The site was first identified by Sir Charles Warren in the 19th century. Further research has confirmed its identity. The white synagogue is from the fourth century that you're seeing pictured here and is built on the exact ruins of the synagogue in Jesus' time. Just take a look at the darker stones for yourself. Sorry, Bob, but the price is wrong here. Very lame pun intended. Finally, skeptical New Testament critics like John Dominic Crossan and Bart Ehrman have argued that because crucifixion is designed to be a humiliating death, Jesus' corpse probably would have at best been buried in a shallow grave and picked apart by wild dogs. What we read in the Gospels about Joseph of Arimathea, according to Ehrman and Crossan, is just pious fiction. But in 1968, building contractors working in a Jewish neighborhood in northeast Jerusalem came upon an ancient burial site containing 35 bodies. One tomb contained the bones of two generations of a family who had lived in the century before Jesus. A member of that family was Yohohanan, who was between 24 and 28 years old when he died. He was a crucifixion victim and had a 7-inch nail driven through the heel bone on his left foot. Jody Magnus, an archaeology professor who actually teaches at the same college as Bart Ehrman, that's UNC Chapel Hill, had this to say about Ehrman's conclusion. She writes, 
The notion that Jesus was unburied or buried in disgrace is based on a misunderstanding of the archaeological evidence and of Jewish law. I believe that the gospel accounts of Jesus' burial are largely consistent with the archaeological evidence. That's one more whiff for the critics. Over and over, we've seen archaeology prove wrong critical charges made against the Gospels. It's no small wonder that Miller Burroughs, a former professor at Yale and an archaeology expert, said, on the whole, archaeological work has unquestionably strengthened confidence in the reliability of the scripture record. Archaeology has, in many cases, refuted the views of modern critics. This kind of accuracy and detail indicates that the Gospel writers really knew their stuff. They present us with correct information regarding these type of things that we can check out by empirical evidence probably indicates that they were telling the truth when it comes to other things that we can't actually go back and prove. Our faith is a historical faith, and archaeology proves it. 